Described by the Wall Street Journal as a marvelous epitaph to a monumental family, Joseph Sassoon's eponymous historical volume, The Sassoons, charts the remarkable 19th century rise and 20th century fall of a family empire that reached through th across three continents and ultimately changed the destinies of nations. A professor of history and politics at Georgetown University, Sassoon is also a senior associate member at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, and a trustee of the Bodleian Library. His other books include the prize-winning Saddam Hussein's Bath Party, The Iraqi Refugees, and The Anatomy of Authoritarianism in the Arab Republics. Please welcome Joseph Sassoon. Good evening, and thank you, Andy, and thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, stories of family dynasties tends to be uh, rags to riches, but actually in this case, it's riches to rags to riches to decline, kind of four phases. <coughs> and the story is, is really over a very long period in the 19th century and the 20th century. It's the story of uh, a refugee family and what it means to be a refugee that wanted desperately to be accepted in different parts of the world, in this case, first in India and then in Britain. Um, what it meant to be a Jewish family at the time that moves around the globe. Um, and so the story encompasses all these aspects. So the story begins in, in Baghdad, uh, where there has been a Jewish community there for almost 2,500 years. The Sassoons were part and parcel um, of living there. By the 19th century, Baghdad was a province in the Ottoman Empire. Each province had its own governor and its own tax collector. Read today, Minister of Finance. The father of the founder of the dynasty was the president of the Jewish community, but also the tax collector, appointed by the sultan in Constantinople. Governors came, governors went, some were good, some were corrupt. At the end of the 1820s, a corrupt governor came to Baghdad and he started embezzling money from uh, wealthy families, and the way he did it, he would uh, arrest a member of the family, they pay a ransom, he would release the member of the family. He arrested David Sassoon, the oldest son of the sheikh, the father, and when the ransom was paid, the father said, this is gonna be repeated, let's get out, and so the son and his young family fled Baghdad to southern Iraq now, Basra, and from there to Persia, Iran today. And then the father joined him. An important point is that all his siblings, David's siblings, stayed uh, behind. This is the founder of the dynasty. Um, David Sassoon ended up living in Bushir in southern Iran for about a year. The father actually died there. And here is a very interesting thing, kind, you know, with telling the story of a refugee family. A lot of these merchants moved around in the Gulf or throughout the Ottoman Empire, but he made an incredible decision to move to Bombay, which he didn't know anyone, he had no contacts there, but he went because he was hearing from uh, sailors, merchants, British officials, that India is very open, that in a city like Bombay, all they care is about business and they never pay attention to religion or sect. And I think that's really what drove him. Um, he took his young family with him, and off he went to Bombay, um, which is really, as I said, uh, uh, remarkable. 
the connection to Baghdad stayed very, very strong throughout the first two generations of the Sassoons, and I will come back and talk to, about it. It was the homeland a connection on every level. Obviously, as I said, family members were still there, but religious connections, um, trade connections, all continued uh, with Baghdad. Um, a very early decision that David Sassoon made upon arriving in Bombay is to identify with the British Empire. And again, you have to think about it from the point of view of a refugee family that left without anything. Britain was the only superpower at the time with a vast empire which was expanding at the time. And so he made his decision that the family will identify with the British Empire and he was very consistent in that uh, policy. To the extent that um, by the 1853, 20 years, 21 years after arrival in Bombay, he was granted a British citizenship, although he neither set foot in Britain nor spoke English. He spoke Arabic, Hebrew, Persian, Turkish, and upon arrival in Bombay, learned Hindustani, but for some reason never bothered to learn English. And in fact, in the archives, he signed this document in Hebrew. Um, notice that he's swearing allegiance not only to a sovereign state, but to a corporation, um, the East India Company. But the East India Company was the body that was controlling um, India for almost 200 years, and that lasted until 1857. Um, so this aspect of becoming part and parcel and serving the British Empire is really very important to keep in mind throughout the story. I actually tell it in the book, in the preface, I was never really interested in the history of the Sassoons. As Andy said, my expertise is in the Middle East, modern Middle East, but somehow one thing led to another. But the main reason really that made me want to write the history is discovering this incredible trove of documents of the correspondence of the family. For some reason, it seems that the family kept every scrap of paper. The problem was that this is, was in for a long time at the National Library in Jerusalem, but no one wrote about it for a simple reason. This is a combination of three languages, and you need to decode all three. It's a Baghdadi Jewish dialect, but it's Arabic, and it's in Hebrew letters. And if you add the layer of the handwriting, which is terrible, then you really have four things to, to contend with, making it worse also to understand and follow is the fact that there are no paragraphs, no bullet points, nothing. It goes on from one subject to another without anything. The beginning is formal, the end is formal, but in between just almost feels sometimes reading it, it's like two people talking on the phone and shifting from one subject to another. But it opened up really an incredible array of ideas, of history, and part of that hidden history which I was really delighted is discovering that actually there was a, a, the, one of the main per personalities that no one has ever written about before is a woman who was the CEO of a, the global trading firm. In fact, the only woman who was a CEO at the end of 19th century there were a lot of matriarchs all around the world in different areas, different places, but not a proper CEO running the daily business of 
a global uh, trading firm. And I will talk about her and happy to take questions also about her. Um, so there are a lot of people in the book, but there are five main characters. The David Sassoon that I mentioned, his oldest son, Abdullah, and you will notice between brackets, most of them anglicized their names at one point or another. The second son, Elias, and then Farha, who anglicized her name to Flora, the woman that I just mentioned. And then a much later period, Victor Sassoon, that I will end up with because he moved to China and there is kind another part of the story there. Um, family was really a very important aspect. David Sassoon was very traditional, was religious to a large extent, you could say. Um, his first wife died after having given birth to four children, two boys and two daughters. Um, died after the birth of the fourth child, which was really kind prevalent at the time. We're talking about early 19th century. A year later, he married his second wife, and with her, they had 10 surviving children. So together, there were 14 children. And in the book, I call them the small army of the Sassoons because the way he deployed them as the business expanded. And here is an interesting aspect. David Sassoon actually didn't know anything about trading. Neither his family was in the trading business. Actually, they were tax collectors. They had two things going for them. One is a tremendous reputation throughout the Ottoman Empire and Persia. And two, phenomenal contacts that they accumulated throughout generations with different merchant families in the, the Ottoman Empire and, and, and Persia. From an early age, the sons were trained, were at very young age, 16, sent to Baghdad. Why? To learn the language. Because remember, you have to know Arabic in order to be part of this language that they were corresponding it and learn meeting traders, and also from a religious point of view where they felt that kind Baghdad is the kind, the source of, of their religious uh, education. Although he did not have, as I said, any trading experience, he obviously was an incredible learner. He would, for example, in the beginning, hang around the cotton exchange in Bombay and quickly figured out that interesting um, news about harvest, like in the United States in 1850s, um, pushed prices of cotton. So he entered the cotton business. And of course, that proved a very important aspect because 10 years later, the Civil War erupted, and he was trading um, cotton. Two things that really haven't changed today or then for a successful business, and David Sassoon figured it out at a very early stage. That is information and networks. And whether it's through his families, through his contacts, through his relatives, he created an incredible amount of network around the globe. And then, of course, through the networks, information was flowing. He was the first among all merchant families in India to send a son in the mid-1850s to London because he realized London is the center of capitalism, it's the main place for finance, and he wanted someone to give him that kind of information and create the right, net the right network. Um, 
That proved to be incredibly helpful when the American Civil War broke out because having someone in London close to the British government, close to British sources, meant extra information that other people in India didn't have. How, why it is important? The beginning of the Civil War, the first two years of the Civil War, cotton prices quadrupled. There were even rumors that people were tearing their mattresses and selling cotton. But then other suppliers like Brazil, Egypt entered the market and there was an oversupply. By the end of the American Civil War, 82% of all traders in Bombay filed bankruptcy because they got stuck with a huge amount of, uh, store, of, of cotton. So all this makes it clear why it was very important. Apart from these five, there are really a lot of others. There, there is for you, anyone who's interested in World War I or poetry, there is the famous poet Siegfried Sassoon. There is Sir Philip Sassoon, who was an art connoisseur and who became at some point in the 1920s uh, Deputy Secretary of the Air Force in, in Britain. Um, so the building of this network continued, and it is really truly remarkable that within such almost 25 years, this how it looked, the, the, the map of the business of the Sassoons. Um, notice the three hubs, the red. First, there was Bombay, then Shanghai, and as I mentioned, London, particularly by the 1870s, become the next hub. Um, a lot of them are port cities all over, and um, in fact, as one of the competitor put it by the early 1860s, and I'm quoting, silver and gold, silks, gums and spices, opium and cotton, wool and wheat, whatever moves over sea or land, feels the, land, the hand or bears the mark of Sassoon and co. And so they were really quick into everything of all the commodities. They were never in the banking business. They never lent money. And that was kind of a, a, a basic rule. And I can talk about it later on with regard to uh, you know the reception by the upper aristocracy in Britain. But it is really very important. 1839, 1842, the first Opium War, China opens um, to foreigners and opium became a legal commodity. He immediately after the end of the war sent his second son, Elias, to explore the possibilities, and sure enough, they establish a bridge to trade in with China, opium, silk, and, and tea. Um, a fascinating thing that came up from the archives and looking at their trading books is something truly innovative that they did. They imposed a charity tax on every trade that they did. So in the book, in the ledgers, you see, for example, chest of tea cost, a transfer cost, maritime insurance cost, and always, always the last line, a charity tax, a quarter of 1%. Now, you could say a quarter of 1% is not that much, correct? But two things to keep in mind. One, they were doing hundreds, if not thousands, of trades by the 1850s, 1860s. And two, the tax is imposed irrelevant whether the trade is profitable or not. 
which is very different from other benefactors who they had a good year, they gave money, they didn't have a good year, they didn't give money or much less. Um, this charity tax was used only and only in the places where they lived and worked and where they had the workforce. Some of it went to the Jewish communities where they lived. So these two synagogues are the one, the, the blue one is a functioning synagogue in, 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 in uh, Bombay, not very far from where David Sassoon lived. Then when he moved to Pune in the last few years of his life, because it has a little bit better weather in the sense of less humidity, he built this incredible synagogue, which you still can see it from almost anywhere in Pune, which is about five hours drive from Bombay. And he actually is um, buried in, in the grounds of that synagogue. Uh, but there were also other things that are not religious. The David Sassoon Library, which still exists, and you can see it, it's in the heart of Mumbai today. This is a picture of his statue at the entrance. And there were a lot of these, there were, of, of these um, charitable donations to the city where they lived and where uh, they were. Let's move on. 1864, David Sassoon died. Remember, he had 14 children. He left a will that his oldest son, Abdullah, shall become the next boss, the next chairman. The second son, Elias, refused to abide by that. Said, I was the one for the last five, six years, seven years in China, going up and down. I put the firm firmly there. I brought in more profits, on and on. I think it's fair to be 50-50. Three years, the archives has negotiations between the brothers. Nothing came out of it, and we don't know really what the views of all the other brothers and sisters in this case. But the end result that in 1867, the firm split into two Sassoons, David Sassoon and Co. and Edie Sassoon and Co. Elias David Sassoon. And the brothers never exchanged a word till their death. And the two firms competed from that day on fiercely with each other. And it was very confusing. Um, the Chinese found a great way to deal with it and not to get confused. They called David Sassoon the old Sassoon and the new one the new Sassoon to distinguish between the two. Um, As I mentioned, he sent one son to London back in the 1850s, then another son, another sister, and they started the migration to London. Um, Albert Abdallah, the oldest son, stayed in Bombay to compete with his brother to, to run the business, but was itching to move to London. And somehow, in 1872, he was knighted by Queen Victoria. He changed his name, and from that point on, he became known as Sir Albert. Um, then he did move to London. And afterwards, the same year, a year later, he was given this incredible honor at a large gathering at the Guildhall in London. Um, and I, as the presentation brochure stated, and I quote, this is the first time an East Indian merchant has been admitted to the honor highly prized by its possessor and much coveted by the aspirants to city fame. It is the first that the freedom of the city of London has been presented to a Jew. It, 
it actually, when you think about it, it was really an incredible honor and marked the zenith of a remarkable ascent from Baghdadi exile into an accredited upper crust member in just four decades. They left in the 1830s, we're early 30s, and we're talking about the early 1870s. And thus, this migration, the second wave of migration to Britain, the second change, in the beginning they really desperately wanted to be accepted and part and parcel on, in India. When they got that, the the David Sassoon himself never thought that his children are going to leave India. In fact, in the will, the main house and office is stated in the will that shall, shall not be sold for 51 years after the death of, of the founder. But they all more or less moved. Actually, one of the ones who stayed behind is a Flora who was married to a Sassoon. She's a Sassoon, but married a Sassoon. And so this was a turning point for uh, uh, the family. One of the interesting things when you look at the archives of the family, almost 100 years of correspondence, not once, the question was asked between members of the family or their employees, should they trade or not trade with someone because of religion or sect or identity? Never, ever, never comes up. What really always came up is, can we trust the counterpart? That was the question, not the question, what is the religion or the identity of the person? And so years later, when they became more Europeanized, they had their emblem, their emblem with the trust, you could see that, Emet Imuna in Hebrew, Candide Constante in, in Latin. But there are also many symbols. There is symbol of the palm tree. There are some religious symbols. There are symbol of the palm tree to remind them of their home. So this aspect of becoming part of this move to move, first generation married only and only Baghdadi Jews. And if they didn't find their partner in, in India, they sent emissaries to Baghdad to find a match. The second one continued, but a little bit more into a different aspect. And they began marrying European, Jewish European families aristocrat. Um, let me just read you um, about one such marriage. So Albert's son, his second son, um, Edward, married Aline Caroline um, daughter of Baron Gustav de Rothschild of Paris on October 19th, 1887. Okay, um, I'm just going to read you what the local newspaper. The wedding was attending by seemingly every grandee in Paris. The Grand Rabbi of France conducted the ceremony to a packed synagogue on Rue de la Victoire. The flowers, the singing, the jewels, the presents, the oratory, the titles, the aroma of wealth took away the breath of every spectator, completely overpowered by the magnificent of the fete. At the reception, the guests, just about 1,200, um, were entertained by a chorus from the Paris Opera and the groom gave the bride a pearl necklace costing about 9,000 pounds, more than one and a half million US dollars at today. And Aline brings them together, her charm, her connections. Now they are really setting up into that level of aristocracy. Well, if you're marrying 
this kind of marriages and having to give these kinds of pearls, you better have the right houses um, to be seen and to entertain in, in, in all those places. They always had huge houses. The, the one to the left, Son Susi, in Bombay, was the first house that David Sassoon bought in Bombay. It's huge. It is truly huge. It's actually today a very large hospital, Messina Hospital in Bombay. Obviously, um, it's still there are remnants of there, so the emblem actually is in the staircase. Uh, you could see some of the houses in Park Lane, in Ashley Park. Um, anyone who is anyone at the time had to buy a house in Brighton, like the Hamptons at the time. In Pune they had. But let me just read you um, this. Uh, all of Albert's brothers except one, Suleiman, who was married to Flora, uh, have now were became resident in London. Arthur lived on Albert Gate near Hyde Park. He was believed to have one of the best music rooms in any home in London and one of the city's finest staircases. They had something with staircases wherever they went. Frederick the youngest lived in Knightsbridge. Reuben, meanwhile, had settled at one Belgrave Square amusingly described as one of England's 12 most beautiful houses. Unusually for the time, the house had three elevators, one for dinner, another for domestic staff, and one to connect the stable with the street outside. It was seen as one of the most technically advanced homes in London, the numerous bathrooms had showers, we're talking early 19th century, and the elevator in the stables had been installed so that the horses could be housed above ground level to benefit from natural light. <laughs> there were reportedly, quote, so many ingenious mechanical arrangements in Mr. Sassoon's house that an engineer is in residence to answer for their perfect working order. And so that tells you what was going on. Now, if you live in those houses and you are in that upper class, part of being in the upper class in Britain is you don't work. And because you're not supposed to work if you are a real aristocrat. And so, to me, this is a very interesting picture because now it's not only houses in London and in the countryside. Now you have to have the huge estates in Scotland, such as this, for hunting, shooting, and horse riding. These are the hobbies of the upper British class, and so you have to play uh, uh, the game. I found in the archives a fascinating letter um, from two members of the family. They said, we went to the office at 11 o'clock in the morning. At 1, we went to lunch at the club, and at 3, we went to the uh, horse racing um, to bet on horses. And my first reaction, what would have David Sassoon or Albert thought about that members of the family are spending only two hours working while the first and probably most of the second generation work six days a week, 14 hours? This change of work ethics was all really part of the dramatic changes that was taking place in, in, in the family. Flora Sassoon became uh, the head of the family at the end of the 19th century for six years. The men in the family could not stomach her success. They kept pushing her out, and I actually, there is a whole chapter about her in the book. She was incredibly innovative, um, an incredible personality on, in all fronts. They pushed her out. 
And actually, to me, that signifies the beginning of the end of the first, the old Sassoon, the David Sassoon, and co. Other people came in, but there was really no more um, regeneration of the business or anything interesting. Um, the other family had the Edi Sassoon, one of the descendants of Elias is Victor Sassoon. 1926, he makes a decision to uproot from India because he believes China is going to be far more friendly to foreign investors. And so he get out. By then, there is no commodity trading also. And so the focus is real estate and real estate only. He built the first skyscraper in, in Shanghai, and you could see the picture in the 1930s. It, today, you could still see it. It's a five-star hotel, a Fairmont Hotel. It's a beautiful, beautiful building that really hasn't lost any of its charm and its magnificent uh, 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 location. He um, moved there um, with the idea of course, that everything is going to be much better in China. And to a certain extent, he proved to be right, but just for 11 years, because 1937, the Japanese invaded Shanghai. Two years later, World War II broke out, Pearl Harbor, and Shanghai and China is fully occupied by Japan. He left, um, he left China. Of course, in 41, um, he was a playboy. He was really just loved glamour. Uh, Marlene Dietrich was rumored to be one of his girlfriends. You could see a picture of with Charlie Chaplin in Hollywood. Um, and then he went back in 1945 when the war ended, but then another war began, which was the civil war between the nationalist and the communist. And at the end of that, of course, 1949, the communists took over and nationalized all foreign assets, including 17 buildings, uh, high buildings, uh, like the one you saw in Shanghai with zero compensation. Um, Victor didn't have the strength to restart and he also had health issues because he was injured as a pilot in World War I. And so he married his nurse, who was 30 years younger than him, moved to the Bahamas, and that's really kind where it, he stayed. I just want to read you one last thing uh, before we open it for a question. The arc from unassuming beginnings to spectacular success and ignoble and took the two Sassoon companies less than a century and a half to traverse. The sheer rapidity of the opening and closing acts draws the obvious question, why? Why did they thrive where so many other trading families merely subsided? or even failed. And having reached the heights that they did, what went wrong? Well, for that, you need to read the book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm amazed at the similarity between the Rothschild dynasty and the Sassoon dynasty. So similar from the beginning sending their, in the, in the case of the Rothschilds, only the boys out just the way you explained was done by the Sassoons. I'm wondering, I'm intrigued about that letter that um, he wrote in four or five different languages. It must have been, well, I'm wondering who was able to decipher what it was what it was because it was in, it, it was almost in in a, a impossible to to read it so could you explain sure that? sure um the language anyone who at the time grew up in baghdad in the jewish community could read it and write it so although it is 
looks like a coded language. It was not a coded language for the locals. Now, here is the plus and the minus. The plus was, you know, at the time, traders sent messages uh, with messengers, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks on boats. But one of the things you discover and you read in different histories that a lot of times messengers arrived at the final port and then they proceeded to sell the information that was in the letter to competitors. But no one could sell the information of the Sassoons. The, the negative is later on when the firm was so global and so huge that they could not hire people from outside because they needed them to write in that language. Um, and just going back to your first comment, yes, there are a lot of similarities um, with the Rothschild. In an interesting manner, they were better accepted in Britain than the Rothschilds. Um, and part of it is the, you know, the, the, the anti-Semitism so that with the money lenders, well, they were not money lenders. The British aristocracy did not like uh, nouveau riche. They did not like people who made it from nothing and grew. Well, the Sassoons were very wealthy, as I said, in Baghdad back in, in the early 19th century and 18th century. And in India, they became very quickly known as the merchant princes. So from that point of view. And they became very, very close to royalty. I mean, one of their closest friends was the Prince of Wales, Victor Queen Victoria's son, for more than uh, 30 years. But obviously, there was this marriage that I mentioned also. Hi. Um, you mentioned questioning in the letters not whether what not not what religion someone was but whether a correspondent could be trusted can you just talk a little bit about that and and who you know kind of were their colleagues sort of spread across many religions and ethnicities that's one question and the other question is you spoke about the generation of david and perhaps his sons and um being observant what about the later generations thank you um, it, to me, was the most fascinating, how did they figure out this trust, reputation? But then, you know, part of the problem at the time, you don't have the information you have now. But it is really amazing. They seem to have, throughout the different parts, traders, merchants, um, sailors, had ideas about, you know, X had a bad reputation. The problem is once someone had a bad reputation, no one is ever going to trade, and the per that person cannot really correct <laughs> this idea. So, but it, it seems it had worked, mostly. Um, there were times that people didn't pay, but then the minute you don't pay or you don't receive or you don't supply, kind you're really burning the bridges. That no one is ever going to be willing to trade with you. So the risk was very, very high. Um, with, with regard so to the second question, yes, I mean, some of actually... Religion never, they were very, very, uh, the first two generations were kind of religious, the f especially the first generation. But that didn't prevent them from having friends on all, you know. Bombay was very cosmopolitan. There were Muslims, Christians, Parsis, Portuguese. Um, and that made a big difference. The Parsis, um, who are really kind of Russian from, as you know, who moved to India from Persia uh, and still there. The Tatas who own Jaguar and uh, a, a lot of other businesses still today were their closest uh, um, 
people that they worked with, and actually you see that the Sassoons were on their boards and the Tatas were on their. So, and, but even through correspondence, which I thought is fantastic, for example, the oldest son, Abdullah, had a, 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 a merchant in Iran, in Isfahan. They never met, but after 25, 30 years, um, the correspondence is really touching because it became more kind, you know, half a page about business and another half a page is really about, you know, family problems, family issues, health on both sides, and they never met. But there was a fundamental trust that existed between the two of them for more than three decades. Well, I was just curious where you fit into the family, and I just want to say in uh, 1977, um, Lady Sassoon came to my wedding. Um, I knew her in 1977, 1978, um, and I was wondering if she's still living because I couldn't find an obituary for her, and I also brought the wedding present she gave me to show you that has something to do with Sir Victor Sassoon. With, with? My husband, Sir Victor Sassoon. Oh, Sir Victor Sassoon, okay. Um, I mentioned at the beginning when David Sassoon left, his siblings stayed behind in Baghdad. I'm the descendant of one of those siblings. In fact, I was born in Baghdad, so continued for a little bit longer <laughs> after they left. Um, it, it, Victor Sassoon's wife, no, died. She, she died in Dallas. Um, and actually, she bequeathed the uh, papers of Victor Sassoon to uh, the South Methodist University in, in, in Dallas. I just, oh, sorry. Um, I wanted to ask a question about Flora. Um, Flora seemed like an amazing woman. And um, I was wondering, how did she get to the position of, of leading uh, at that time, you know, when it was so very clearly dominated by a lot of the men, her brothers, and her family? And, you know, did she get the education, you know, that they had? Um, how did she get to that position in, in the family and, and in the company? Thank you. Um, so all the women in, in the Sassoon family actually were well-educated. In fact, one of the first um, charitable work was setting up a, a girls' school in, in Bombay. Um, so by age 17, she was rumored to have spoken seven languages and could recite Shakespeare from beginning to end. Um, her relationship, actually, she fell in love with this other Sassoon who used to be in different parts of the empire working for the Sassoons, of course. And I, I think unlike many of the marriages at the time, their marriage was really kind of true partnership rather than an arranged marriage. They had three children. As he was kind, his health was declining, she announced that she wants to start going to the office three, four times a week. Let me tell you, that sounds really simple, but created an uproar in the mercantile community in India. A woman in the 19th century in the office Traders, I mean, it was even in the newspaper. What are they supposed to do now that there is a woman? When they struck a deal, there was a hug <laughs> with the counterpart. There was handshaking. What are they supposed to do? This is not fair. She bulldozed. She said, I don't care. Whoever wants to shake hands, I'm happy to shake hands. You don't want to shake hands, don't shake hands. But she sat there for three years, four years, three times a week, listening. 
And towards the end, it was clear he was discussing with her every decision. So she ended up knowing who all the traders, who are the counterparts, how is the business. And you are absolutely right. She was really phenomenal. Do you know that letter that I showed you, which is typical of the correspondent? She said, this is unreadable. Yes, it was <laughs> unreadable. She changed it to bullet points. And she said she doesn't want a lot of chit-chat around different uh, Go through the things, say yes, no, this is the answer. She created stuff really, truly like of business. For example, currency hedges, risk analysis, amount of how much to be lent at any point, how much risk exposure with it. The more successful she was, the more angry her family in London became, all out of spite. Not because of her, just they couldn't stomach her success. And the only criticism that you could see in the correspondence, how could a widow with three children run a global business? The fact that they were sitting in, in, in London going to casinos and, and horse racing is fine, but she's working 12, 14 hours a day. Um, that, you know, how can a widow run a business? And they kept conspiring for six years until they created a system where they pushed her out. And she actually really was fed up um, at the end of it. And she, she said, I will not deal with any business. I don't want to be, because a lot of people thought she's going to be the next Elias Sassoon, like creating another competing firm. But she really did not want. But she continued to be a very remarkable person. She was very religious and very knowledgeable in, in the Bible, in the Talmud. Um, she was the first woman to ever to be invited uh, to the ordaining of rabbis in, in England. And instead of thanking the committee that uh, invited her, she blasted them and she said, let me understand, it says in the invitation that I am capable or whatever. Are you saying that you couldn't find one woman for 70 years who is capable? Um, and, and she really w became the matriarch or, of, of the family. When you showed the map, I noticed that Bangkok was not one of their locations. Bangkok. Bangkok was not shown as one of their, is that because, I, I'm guessing because Thailand was not uh, a place where British colonialism had its footprint and therefore they were doing well, the Sassoons as traders were doing well enough with what they had, but is it that had they wanted to deal with Bangkok, they couldn't because Thailand, I mean, I guess my question is, just how closed was Thailand at that period? Because you would think with so many locations, they would also have um, been there. I, I think it's a matter really of, of, of the commodities they were trading, because by the 1910, 15, I did find some like trading with Vietnam, which was obviously totally under French control um, at the time. But I haven't seen. There are really a lot of other places that I'm sure they were. For I know for a fact they were in Burma because there is in Burma uh, a Sassoon synagogue that uh, that they built. Um, but I have not found uh, anything that relates to Thailand. In the multilingual letter that's been discussed, there were at least three references to the import-export of opium. Yes. So I was wondering how much of this empire was built on the um, trade of narcotics. Um, opium was an important um, aspect of, of the creating of the creation of the empire. 
um, t t uh, after the uh, first and second opium war where opium became um, legal commodity. Um, it's, I, I devote in the book a lot about the opium and talk about it, and I learned really a lot from researching. One, I didn't realize that until 1907, you could go into any pharmacy in New York or London or Paris and um, just say you have a headache or indigestion and you would be prescribed uh, opium. Um, second, even when there was a huge opposition to the opium, um, the British Parliament set up the government. The British government set up a, a committee of inquiry that went on for five years, and collected twenty thousand uh, uh, witnesses, uh, documents, and and uh, questioned twenty thousand, and published seven volumes. The conclusion was, this is too much of an exaggeration, and that in essence, opium, if taken in small dose, is no different from alcohol. I'm telling you this, not trying to defend it. I'm just telling you that this was the environment that existed at the time. So this is medical experts who say, if you ban it, you ban whiskey. And I can tell you what the reaction in the British Parliament when they heard that they might ban whiskey. Uh, I think it's really, really important because it took me a lot of time. I mean, and I criticize a lot of aspects of it if you read the book. But definitely opium. Opium also was 16% of the total exports of India. Basically, they exported opium to, to China, and they imported in return silk and tea. Even later on, role when obviously opium comes to a final end in World War I because all governments on all sides needed the morphine for their soldiers, so, and they control it. Um, but every time also, by the end when Indian production of opium went almost to zero, guess what happened? Chinese local production went up and filled the same demand, if not more. But it did play a role. Thank you all very much.